Um, I was watching some of the Queen's funeral the other day, and one of the things that stood out to me amongst all of the pomp and ceremony uh, was the number of titles that she held. And amongst all of her titles, the one that stood out to me the most was Defender of the Faith. Uh, It is a title that I had heard before but had never really thought much about. I knew that while her position as the head of the Church of England was more symbolic than functionary, she nevertheless had a sincere and genuine personal faith. But with her death, both the title and position passed on to her son, King Charles. And as many people in Australia and the rest of the Commonwealth are discussing the relevance and role of the monarchy, In a world that feels increasingly hostile towards religion, and particularly Christianity, it has got me wondering about the relevance and role of the defender of the faith. Today we are going to see how in Psalm 56 David navigates living in a hostile world by trusting in God to save him. We'll see how Jesus lived and sang Psalm 56 trusting in the promises of God in the face of opposition and death. And we'll see how we can sing Psalm 56 today in the face of opposition and hostility, trusting in the promises of God because of the way Jesus fulfilled all Old Testament scripture, including Psalm 56. Let me pray and then we'll read Psalm 56 together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that we can meet freely and openly today to read your word and worship you. Lord, as we consider what you have to say to us today, we ask that you would give us hearts and minds to receive your word and that by your spirit you would make us to be more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Um, Please open your Bibles to Psalm 56, which can be found on page 501. Psalm 56, for the choir director, according to a silent dove far away, a mictum of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Be gracious to me, God, for a man is trampling me. He fights and oppresses me all day long. My adversaries trample me all day for many arrogantly fight against me. When I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? They twist my words all day long. All their thoughts against me are evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps while they wait to take my life. Will they escape in spite of such sin? God, bring down the nations in wrath. You yourself have recorded my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will retreat on the day when I call. This I know. God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere humans do to me? I am obligated by vows to you, God. I will make my thanksgiving sacrifices to you. For you rescued me from death, even my feet from stumbling to walk before God in the light of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The introduction to Psalm 56 tells us that David composed it when the Philistines seized him in Gath. If you're like me, then when reading the introductions to Psalms, 
You can tend to glaze over them with a righto. Now on to the main thing. Uh, but there's nothing righto about David being seized by Philistines in Gath. Gath was a city of the Philistines, Israel's greatest enemy in the time of David. Uh, but it wasn't just any enemy city. It was the hometown of Goliath, David's most famous vanquished enemy. The mere fact that David would have been in Gath is astounding. That he made it out alive is, without any exaggeration, nothing short of a miracle. What on earth was David doing in Gath? Uh, I was trying to think of a modern equivalent. Um, I think it would have been like if Osama bin Laden had have rocked up to New York and tried to visit Ground Zero after the September 11 attacks. Uh, he would have had to have been out of his mind to think that visiting Gath would be a good idea. Uh, but as we see in 1 Samuel 21, the danger that he was facing at home was so extreme that it left him with little choice, out of the frying pan and into the fire, so to speak. To understand the danger he was facing, we need to go back a bit for some context. At that time, David had been anointed king, but not crowned king. Saul was still on the throne. David had defeated Goliath in battle, and his fame was growing throughout Israel and beyond. Saul had failed to trust God and had been told by Samuel that the kingdom would be taken from him. On the lookout for the one likely to succeed him, Saul rightly recognised David as a suitable replacement and wrongly set himself against God and tried to shore up his dynasty by attempting to kill him. So began a series of events in which David flees and Saul chases, so often almost catching him, but never quite able. In the latest chase, David had received shelter from the priest Ahimelech at Nob, where he was spied on by one of Saul's servants, and then he took off to Gath. Now it seems a rather drastic decision by David to go to the land of his enemies for asylum. But any doubts about Saul's determination and the lengths he would go to kill David are gone when we see that Saul had the priest Ahimelech and his family killed for giving David some bread, an act his own Israelite servants were unwilling to commit, uh, so he got his buddy from Edom to carry out the act. While David was in Gath, he was brought before their king, Achish, whose servants denounced him as the killer of Goliath, and David was in trouble again. He was in deep in enemy territory, caught, pursued by his own people, and afraid, terribly afraid. But he wasn't without hope, because he could come to the Lord in prayer. Be gracious to me, God, he prays, knowing that only God's undeserved mercy could save him then. In verses 1 and 2, the pursuit of his enemies feels unrelenting and overwhelming. All day they attack him, trample him, enemies without number. In verses 5 and 6, they watch and wait and plot. Unable to deal physical damage to David, they twist his words and stir up strife for him. And David turns to God and his glorious word. Now, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? David's theology, his understanding of God and who he is, is solid. Throughout the psalm, David's knowledge that God is for him, therefore mere men don't stand a chance, shines through. See verse 11? In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mere humans do to me? How, though, 
does David know that God is for him? I mean, he's not able to live in his own country and has had to flee to the land of his enemies for safety. It doesn't exactly look like things are going that well for him. If God was for him, shouldn't he be sitting in the palace? Yet he is confident that God is for him because, as Dane Ortland says in his book of devotions on the Psalms, David experiences and knows the tender nearness of God. Look at verse 8. You yourself have recorded my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? God is not some far-off deity for David. He is near and he cares, and David knows it. And this knowledge fills David with the confidence to pray, knowing that God will hear him. He also knows that God is for him because he has experienced firsthand God's saving power. Verse 13, For you rescued me from death, even my feet from stumbling, to walk before God in the light of life. When David was a young shepherd, he was able to fight off wild animals that would have sorted you and me out because God was for him. When he was only a youth against Goliath, who made grown men weak need at the thought of fighting, David acknowledged that it was God who fought for him and rescued him from the Philistine's hand. Numerous times already God had saved David from Saul as he had spears thrown at him and was forced to wander around, evading pursuit and capture. So often trapped and without hope before miraculously escaping. And now, faced with execution in Gath, David's bizarre ploy to act like a madman works. His life is spared and he is able to move on. If a cat has nine lives, then David has 90. And David responds to God's nearness and gracious, saving mercy with thanksgiving, promising sacrifices and acknowledging that God has saved him for a purpose, to walk before God in the light of life. Now the thing about the light of life is that it shines and others can see it and enjoy it. Thinking again about the introduction to this psalm, I found it very interesting that though the experiences were very clearly individual, this song was meant for corporate worship, for the Israelite community to sing. It was David that was in trouble, and it was David who was saved. Yes, he had some buddies with him, but without David they weren't going to be facing those hardships. But the song of protection and deliverance was for all Israel. For the choir director, according to a silent dove far away. I mean, he even put it to a catchy, well-known tune so everyone could sing along. So often in the Old Testament we see that what was good for the king was good for the people. If the king was saved, the people were saved. If the king was right, the people were right. If the king went bad, it went bad with the people. As with the death of Queen Elizabeth, which has brought sadness and reflection with people who never met her, so too the protection and deliverance of David brings joy and gladness for Israel. David experienced it so the Israelites could sing it. But how can we sing it today? I mean, I've heard of churches and bands who will only sing the Psalms, but we aren't Israelites. God's protection of David has no bearing on our lives today, does it? I mean, to answer that question, we need to go through Jesus. Jesus, the true Israelite, who lived the life that David, their greatest king, could not live. Uh, we can do a bit of a compare the pair with David and Jesus, a bit like those superannuation ads, but better. Uh, David was forced to wander throughout Israel and even enter foreign cities to escape danger. 
After John the Baptist was arrested and later executed, Jesus moved to different regions and at different times went to Gentile cities after upsetting the Israelite crowds. And David had enemies watch his step, lurk, stir up strife and plan to take his life. In our reading from Mark 3 today, the Pharisees lurked and watched Jesus in the synagogue in order to accuse him. Knowing this, Jesus healed the man anyway. And then the Pharisees went out and began to plot and plan his murder. David had men twist his words all day long. When Jesus was arrested, his accusers brought in false witnesses who tried to condemn Jesus by twisting his words about the temple and accuse him of blasphemy. When David was in trouble, he praised the word of the Lord. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, he leant on the word of God and told the devil to go. When David was in trouble, he turned to God in prayer and felt the tender nearness of God. Time and again when he was weary and troubled, Jesus took himself away to pray and to be with his Father God. Even the night before he died at Gethsemane, being in anguish with sweat like drops of blood falling from him to the ground, Jesus prayed more fervently. Jesus didn't just sing Psalm 56, he lived it. But then, when he was on the cross, dying, he cried out again to his father. But this time, God turned away. For the first time, Jesus didn't experience the tender nearness of the Father. For the first time ever. Jesus, one with the Father for all eternity, separated, dying, so that you and I, separated from God since Eden, might be reconciled with the Father for eternity. God rescued the man, David, from death, and all Israel sang. God rescues all people who turn to him through Jesus' death that we might sing forever. <coughs> but Jesus' story didn't end there, as Penny reminded us earlier. Jesus died, but Jesus conquered death. Jesus rose victorious from the grave and is seated at the right hand of God now. And just as what was good for David was good for Israel, so too for us. Jesus' resurrection is the confirmation that we too will rise after death to walk before God in the light of life. David overcame his enemies through the grace of God, relying on God alone. Uh, but what about our enemies? Jesus has defeated death for us, so is that all there is? Sit back and wait for Jesus to come and get us and take us home? No. And the Bible makes it clear that we are living in a war zone, not one where we have to fight physical enemies, but the spiritual forces of evil. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. And as we read through the rest about putting on the armour of God, it sounds very much like what David was doing in his battle against physical enemies. The belt of truth, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit which is the word of God and a command to always pray. While our adversaries may sometimes appear to be human, now think of any of the new atheists who deride Christianity and belittle any who have faith in Jesus, our enemy is still the old enemy, the devil. The enemy who convinced our first parents to disobey God, resulting in our separation from him. And the devil's tricks today are the same because they are effective. 
you may feel afraid or attacked for your belief, made to feel foolish for believing in an invisible God. Because of Jesus, you can sing Psalm 56. We can cry out to God and ask him to be gracious to us, to give us strength to continue when giving up can feel so appealing. You may feel trampled, like nothing is ever going right. Everything may be hard. Life may be hard. You might feel oppressed by the burdens of your life. You might be suffering relentless physical, mental, emotional, or any other kind of grief. Because of Jesus, we can sing Psalm 56. Cry out to the God who collects your tears in his bottle, who records your grief, your wanderings, and grieves with you and suffered for you. Know the tender nearness of the Father who gave up his one and only Son for you. You may feel the burden of temptation to sin or the guilt of unresisted sin. Because of Jesus, we can sing Psalm 56. Like David and Jesus, find delight in the word of God. Be habitual about this, about reading your Bible, because the devil is going to be habitual about trying to get you to sin. Like Jesus, rest in the word of God and resist the devil who, as James tells us, will flee from us when we do so. And because of Jesus, we can sing Psalm 56 with the same confidence as David. Because as we saw in our reading from Romans 8, we are already victorious. Because Jesus is victorious. There is no one who can accuse us because Jesus justifies us and intercedes for us. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God now that the love of God has reconciled us to him. Truly, we can say, if God is for us, who is against us? When times are good or when times are tough, sing Psalm 56 and rely on God. And we don't need King Charles to be the defender of the faith because we have Jesus, the defender of the faithful.